This month marks one year since the election of Donald Trump. The Laura Flanders Show released a special report at that time in which we asked our guests to reflect on social change, how it happens, how it doesn't, what they plan to do the day after the election to keep resistance movements alive, and what they do to support their own spirits. One year later, those questions matter more than ever, and our guests today have their own take. Our studio guest is Reverend Jackie Lewis of Middle Collegiate Church. She was a contributor to the 2017 collection Faith and Resistance in the Age of Trump. Then, from Adrian Mary Brown, whom I caught up with in Detroit. She's the author of Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change, Changing Worlds. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the ones who are doing it. Welcome. From Hurricane Harvey to the assault on DACA and young immigrants and the racist right march on Charlottesville, it has been a long, hot summer, with D.C. too frigid to act. We've seen glimpses of love and solidarity and generosity side by side against a whole lot of hate. In such a situation, it's no surprise that faith leaders have been at the forefront of direct action and movement building in many places. Faith, as we know, has the immense power to bring people together as well, if I may say so, as to drive them apart. Joining me today is Reverend Jackie Lewis of Middle Collegiate Church, friend, revolutionary, former guest on this show. Lewis has long participated in resistance work, most recently the fight for universal health care. She's also a contributor to the 2017 collection Faith and Resistance in the Age of Trump. Jackie, welcome to the program. Welcome hey. back, I should say. Hi, Laura. How are you? I'm oh, good. Tell me a little bit about your summer. It seems like I was getting your email messages and you were all over the place half the time getting arrested. It wasn't the summer to chill. Let's just put it that way. Uh, there were lots of things happening and the movement for justice that is interfaith and interreligious was at work and therefore I was at work. But the last couple of days I was in New Mexico really Detaching. Deconstructing, disconnecting, and dismantling my crazy. All right, good. Just so let's get out. that crazy right yeah, back together exactly. again. <laughs> yeah. um, the book, I have to say, in the age of Trump, I heard somebody today say, or this summer say, I want to refer to it as the moment of Trump. Yeah. I don't want to believe that it's an age. It's an age. It's an age. Talk yeah. about it. Well, it's an age because that's why he got elected. I mean, I think we could call the age of Trump as simultaneous with the age of Obama. Mm -hmm. That this wonderful, beautiful rising up of human beings that loved the world enough and had enough, I'm going to call it, holy imagination to elect Barack Hussein Obama as president, I think the kind of equal reaction in the universe was, I can't believe there's a black man in the White House. Mm -hmm. I can't believe there's little black girls in the White House. I can't believe there's someone like this uh, changing our world. And I think that what was underground came up and out of the ground, I think, in a virulent kind of way. And is that what you saw in Charlottesville? Is that what you've been seeing? That's what I think. I think not only in Charlottesville, but um, all along in the kind of rampant shooting of black men running away from cops. I think in violence against uh, Muslims, a woman is shopping and her arm is set on fire. This sort of uh, angry, vitriolic, violent reaction to the browning of America, to the changing of status quo, to the loss of, quote, white power. In fact, demographers tell us that in 20 years, there will actually be no racial ethnic majority in this country. And I think people have lost their minds. So, so <laughs> really do. How do you deal with people that say, wait a minute, I thought history was progressing, the arc of justice, all that stuff. I thought we were moving in a progressive direction. What the heck happened? And if this happened after Barack Obama and after the civil rights movement and given the demographic shifts and all of that, how do I have faith that, that we are it's still worth the effort to make this change? I love when you evoke the, mark, the arc of a moral universe bending toward justice. I mean, it just takes time for it to bend. I think we could chart human history as, you know, stops and starts mm -hmm. and fits and finishes, but faith actually is 
the substance of things hoped for. Mm -hmm. I love that definition. So I think people have, of faith have to imagine that these dips in humanity, these um, really horrific acts against humanity from each other is just temporary and that we need to engage the world, the political world, as though we know we can make a difference. Even because though it we feels can. kind of existential. I mean, it felt existential for the people of Charlottesville to see those torches no, albeit tiki torches, right. but to see those torches in, in that long, fat line. That's exactly right. And then, of course, we have to look at the next snapshot, the beautiful snapshot of all of those clergy of different mm -hmm. faiths standing together, Laura, while they were surrounded by, that, by those torches, clearly afraid, clearly um, evoking the past. And then the next day, candlelight, yeah. right? Because there is going to be, if we engage it, a change in the universe because of who we are and what we believe. And that's happening. You see that happening too. I see that all the time in Absolutely. your church. I mean, right. let's talk about middle collegiate sure. for a bit. I've had the pleasure of Don't being make there me talk about it. as many Sundays <laughs> as I can. Yeah. And everybody seems to be there. Yes. Everybody seems to feel welcome. Right. I and mean, you tell the audience who you mean, who I mean by everybody. Yeah, it's, um, one of my favorite quotes is one of our friends, Susan, says that it's like the subway. And it really <laughs> is. It is packed out with blue jean wearing, pants dropped young people, toddlers and infants all over the pulpit for the message for all ages, blacks, whites, Latinos, Asians, gay, straight, bi, and trans people. One of our leaders is a trans person of faith. I think it is, um, when I think about heaven, if there is a heaven, I think it looks like middle church. A lot of Jewish people a in there A lot too. of Jewish people, a lot of Jewish people, atheists, agnostics at church because they believe in justice, they believe we're doing something about it, and they love the music. So no, everybody's welcome. What, what blows my mind is this one Muslim guy who belongs to the church, who walks up to take the Eucharist every Sunday he's there. Does he know what it means? I don't know, but I think he knows that he's breaking bread with all of these mm -hmm. people who are different than he is, mm -hmm. and all of these people who really believe that love makes a difference. Was Middle Collegiate like that when you arrived? It and how was. long have you been there? I've been there about 13 years. And my predecessor, Gordon, took this 29 Polish old white ladies, he says, and grew it to a church of about 400. And they were black and white. A young man named Jerice Johnson was an actor, uh, HIV AIDS activist, and he started this little gospel choir that's now our big gospel choir that is full of Chinese and Japanese students from NYU. I think the music mattered. They really cared about food justice. They cared about... Uh, LGBT rights, they were the place that did the funerals for all of those people dying of HIV AIDS in the 80s. And therefore the church became a beacon of light in the community, Laura. You're welcome here. You're welcome just as you are as you come through the door. 9-11 happened and people were streaming north from downtown, walking by, coming for baths and water and food and a place to make their kids feel safe. And this is this is in our DNA. You are welcome, just as you are as you mm. come through the door. So it gets me, you know, you know that on this program we talk a lot about alternative models, models yeah. that spread power from the sure. few to the many, that are real lived experiences or ones in the past that were where we organized life differently. And one of the big questions that we've had over and over again, particularly in the last few years, is how do we do community caring differently. Yeah. You know, I don't want to use the word security, policing, but how do we do this looking after each other thing differently? Yeah. Um, what have you been learning, both there at Middle Collegiate and in your summer of arrests? Yeah, let's talk about the summer of arrest. I, I think one of the things that we have to know is true, which is maybe, I mean, I'm a Christian. I'm a universalist Christian, but a Christian. The, the Christian church started in this really multicultural, multiracial pot all of the Jews from all the known world, from these crazy towns that you can't pronounce, were in Jerusalem for this holiday um, where they celebrate the giving of the law, so to speak. And right there were people who spoke different languages, who looked differently from different modes of life. I think what we're learning is that the way the community is going to be strong and resilient is because we build communities of diversity. Mm -hmm. We have to be male and female. We have to be all of our gender performances. We have to be gay and straight and bi and transgender. We have to be Muslim, Christian, Jew, Buddhist, Sikh. We have to represent the, the, the diversity of humanity so we can have empathy with and for one another, so we can understand each other and have each other's backs, mm -hmm. which brings us to the summer of arrest. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, here we were watching these, these months of this crazy administration just dismantle and disrupt everything that's been good about the last couple of decades of American life. Right? And I think 
people were fed up about it. And so you get to healthcare, and healthcare is such a tangible, essential need for every human being, a right for every human being. Sister Simone Campbell, who happens to be also a lawyer and a lobbyist, calls out oh, like, hey, you nuns on the bus, women. exactly, right? You better get on the ball for this, and let's do both some local organizing. Let's go to town halls. Let's go to senators' offices. And then William Barber, who's more of a uh, let's get arrested kind of activist, uh, bringing back the Poor People's Campaign, and had worked on uh, Moral Mondays and, and voters' rights. Yeah, yeah. You get these two amazing minds sending out a, a SOS across the country to a rabbi in LA who gets on the red eye, Sharon Browse, to uh, Angel Kyoto Williams, the only black sensei in the country, Buddhist, gets on a plane to come. I get on a bus, off we go to DC. All of us gathering together, Unitarians, Baptists, Christians, black, black clergy, all of us organizing together, turning our love energy, our revolutionary mm -hmm. love energy toward an issue and understanding that we're bound together by the need for this basic right. This is what the caring communities look like. So it was my turn. And I always said I was never going to get arrested. You have things to do. Honey, plus, by the way, no, that's not my call. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. King's beautiful letter from a Birmingham jail is like, oh, bless his heart. But, you know, it was my turn to stand outside of McConnell's office and speak and pray and sing with my colleagues, and my turn to get those handcuffs on, which really hurt, and my turn to get on a, a, a van, uh, an arrest, arresting van with all these beautiful people singing songs. We sang songs on our way to jail. Um, st on Standing on the shoulders of our mm. ancestors, standing in the way of all of our holy teachers, and standing in the way of Jesus, mm. who actually was arrested, frankly, for being a revolutionary lover, trying to reform uh, his empired world to a world of peace again. Did it change you, just that experience? Yeah, How? it did. It made me ask myself, what won't I do? What won't I do for the healing of the world? And I realized I'll do anything. Mm. And all of us have to do something something that causes us to get out of our comfort zones, something that pushes us to the edge. Well, a lot of people come to their faith painfully. Um, maybe pick one over another one or leave the one they grew up with and find a new one. Um, convert because they fell in love. Uh, and once they get there, they want to keep those boundaries pretty clear. Um, speak to those people. Is there something you have to give up to be as welcoming as you are and, or not? How do you do it? without giving up something that's dear to you? That's such a timely question. These last couple of days, I was in New Mexico at this thing called the Llama Foundation with Father Richard Rohr, who's this million book-selling, New York Best Times author, 75-year-old humble priest guy. And one of the things that happened as I was listening to him, Laura, go deep inside his faith. Like he wasn't, he's not giving up being Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. Way deep in the bedrock of his faith. He says, it's all the same. Mm. It's all the same. And the bedrock of that is, are we willing to let go of our assumptions? Are we willing to be surprised by grace? Are we willing to imagine that God, if there is a God, is speaking to all of us mm. in ways that we need to understand? And so, yeah, I think faith can be just as much a cocoon or bubble or box as anything else, any other kind of philosophy or any other kind of identity. I want to believe I'm right. I, I, and, and I'm anchored in my rightness makes me feel secure. But I think what I've come to know um, at my age <laughs> is being right is not nearly as important as being connected. Yeah. And I think, again, just the, the, the rabbi Jesus that I follow in the ministry, he wasn't about being right. He was about telling stories to help people imagine a new way to be. You've heard it say, but I say. Using language that was appropriate for country, you know, desert wandering farmers and fishermen, mm -hmm. poor people. So I think the bottom line for me, I would want people to think about is, what if the only thing that's right about this stuff is, is that we're called to love each other? Mm. Like what if that's our scripture, love each other? So to push back, yeah, just a tiny bit. Sure. Um, 
I want to believe, I want to believe. But I'm also hearing connect, understand. There's some white racist segregationists who we've been trying to understand for way too long. Amen, that's right. Isn't there a moment where we just say, actually, no, wrong? Well, how do we deal with that? Yeah, let me, let me try to complexify my, my revolutionary love, L love each other. Um, I don't think love is a wimpy, nammy, pammy, you know, you know, turn the other cheek kind of moment. By the way, that turn the other cheek scripture gets so misused to tell people to just be still and be quiet and know that God is God. Go on, hit me, hit yeah, me. Right, right, no, actually that text, Walter Wink, I give credit for this, is turn the other cheek was about how a subordinate relates to an authority figure. If you get backhanded, you turn the other cheek and they're forced to treat you like a person. Mm -hmm. Now that would not really work today, but, but, a, but a kind of corollary might be, what are the strategies that we use, nonviolent confrontation, for example, or care confrontation, or nonviolent resistance? So when you're sitting at a lunchroom counter like all those kids did in that summer, or you're standing uh, 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 on the mall like they did when King took a bunch of folks in. Or there, confronting or, those cops in Ferguson. We just talked about the movie Or at Foley Square yesterday, right, uh, protesting DACA. We, that's the turn the other cheek kind of moment. You stare evil in the face with your bold, brave call to love. and. You also have to, as a person of faith, say, when something is wrong, it's just wrong. And quite frankly, Trump is just wrong. And what's happening right now is all of these so-called Christians, and I'm saying so-called Christians on purpose, because if you're not following in the way of Jesus, then that to me is uh, uh, so-called. Mm -hmm. I mean, will we love our neighbor? Will we make sure our neighbor has food on the table? Will we make sure everybody has enough? How can a nation of immigrants suddenly be anti-immigrants? Like, who do we think we are? So there's something faithful full about calling foul on foul, and not only talking about it, but what are we gonna do about it? Mm -hmm. So we have to organize together. We have to stand against the things that feel to be unjust, because they are. And that uncle who maybe espouses horrific views over Thanksgiving dinner, um, and voted for Trump, Yeah. how about him? Like he's not as clearly just all awful, and he's not in power yeah. like Trump. Yeah. But at the same time, he has been getting an awful lot of attention for yeah. an awfully long time. And yet I understand he feels threatened and vulnerable and all the rest. You know, when the election happened uh, in November, I did a sermon right after the Sunday hour, which was packed out with people looking for answers. I think I surprised my congregants that I wasn't yelling as much about Trump as I might have. Because that day, my pastoral concern was for all the people who felt like their relatives, their friends, their Uncle Bob had betrayed them right. by, by making this. So what, what do we want to do? We want to have tools for how to have what I call a care confrontation. Yeah. Like how, you got to talk to Uncle Bob. And when you're talking to Uncle Bob, you want to be asking Uncle Bob a question. Dude, what were you thinking when you, when you pulled that lever? What were you hoping for? What were you dreaming for? And then I think we have to talk about our own dreams and ask ourselves, especially now, almost one year into this madness, how's it working? Is this working? And if it's not working, how are we going to communicate that to our representatives? Who are we going to call and tell? This, to me, praying like Rabbi Heschel with your feet and with your hands and with your phone call and with your Twitter handle, to sh tell a better story, Laura, right? Like, the better story is maybe, we, maybe we're disappointed. Maybe our lives were tough. Maybe we had our own dreams failing. But does this look like the dream of God. Does this look like love to you? No. When 800,000 young people are going to be punished for being 800,000 young people. So I think we have to engage a, an imagination for a better world that we can create together. And any person of faith who doesn't think that they should be political is just mistaken. Because politics is about the people and our faith has to be a horizontal kind of faith. Not just about us and God, but us and each other. I love it. Reverend Jackie Lewis uh, is the reverend, the pastor at Middle Collegiate Church in New York, and also a contributor to the new book, Faith and Resistance in the Age of Trump. You can find more information and see some of Jackie's preaching at our website. Thanks.
Organizing for what we want, building collaborative strategies, and learning better ways of relating to one another and the planet. Adrian Murray Brown talked about all that and more when I met with her recently in Detroit. She's a social justice facilitator, a pleasure activist, and the author of Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change, Changing Worlds. She's also the co-editor of Octavia's Brood, science fiction from social justice movements. Here's Adrian Mary Brown. Emergent strategies are ways of looking at the world, the natural world um, that we're a part of, and searching for collaborative efforts. Like where does collaboration happen? Where is right relationship happening between humans and the planet, between different parts of the planet? And what can we as a species learn about how to be in right relationship with each other and with the planet that we're living on? We're filming this in September. And we've just come through a week where there were three hurricanes, an earthquake, a potential tsunami. Um, there was flooding, there's droughts, there's a fire raging the entire West Coast. At the same time, all the news that's coming out of the White House is devastating for our folks. We have people who are like, DACA is the thing that has kept my family together, the thing that has allowed me to be in the place that I'm from. Everything feels like it's so heavy and so intense, and how do we survive this moment? It doesn't feel like we can. And Emergent Strategy posits, actually, all of these changes, these are something that we need to figure out how we embrace and how we also shape them. So Emergent Strategy is really Life moves towards life, longing moves towards longing. And if we're not also organized towards what we really want and what we long for, we will always settle into just reacting and trying to stop something bad from happening. The trick of this book is that everything you need to know is on pages 41 and 42 and on page 50. If you just read those two pages, or you can look at page 15, page 15 also basically has the entire thesis, everything about the book is right there. So this Octavia Butler quote, all successful life is adaptable, opportunistic, tenacious, interconnected, and fecund. Understand this, use it, shape God. So from that, I would say emergent strategy is learning how to be fractal. Small scale reflects a large scale. How to be adaptive in right relationship to change, but also with intention. Because if you just change all the time, you're just changing all the time. You're just a mess. You're just a leaf blown in the wind. But changing with an idea of like, oh, I'm a bird. I'm trying to get to Mexico for my migration. A storm came. How do I still get myself to Mexico? Then nonlinear and iterative, resilient, being in a practice of transformative justice, which I think we are just beginning to understand what transformative justice is or could be for us as a species. And then interdependent and decentralized, and always creating more possibilities. One of my favorite examples right now from the nat you know, sort of the world of nature has been in this flooding that's been happening with the hurricanes, watching how ants have come together to survive. Um, and they form, they basically create a foundation of their own bodies, like a bottom layer of their own bodies that then other ants climb on top of and climb on top of until they create this floating mound that then is able to make sure that the majority of them survive until they come across something that is a higher ground. Right now we are drowning in the overwhelm of this political moment and the overwhelm of hard decisions. How do we reach out and hold on to each other knowing that holding on to each other makes us a more stable body that can actually float and not pushing each other down, not you know pushing each other under. Um, one of my favorite examples in the human world is actually the work of Black Lives Matter and the movement for black lives and feeling like this was emergent. It's not like someone sat down at a table and was like, I've got it all figured out. I know how we're gonna catalyze black people into their liberation fight and taking direct action right now. That's not what happened. There was just a heartbreak. It really, to me, it grows out of a heartbreak. Like if you look at the original post that Alicia put, it was like, my heart is broken and our lives matter. And that that heartbreak was so catalyzed that other people were like, yeah, how do we organize ourselves around what we long for and we believe in this moment when everything is telling us we don't matter, but we, we know we do. How do we move that? And that so many people answered that call and that they have really tried to hold like, oh, what does decentralization look like? How do we keep adapting to changing conditions? Things that organically emerge from a real desire and a real longing, those are the ones that catalyze the most other people. They're super compelling. Like when you see someone feeling a real emotion, that's what you want to move towards and, and be like, I want to be a part of this. It's not just 
getting me to sign my name on a petition. It's not just getting me to be a number in the street. You actually want me to care about my own life and my children's life. Yeah, I'm, I'm down for that. One thing I say in here several times is what you pay attention to grows. So this administration wants us to put all of our attention on them. And I would rather starve them of all of that attention to put all of it on the amazing work that's happening here in Detroit or in Jackson or in the Bay or in all these other places, St. Louis, where people are like, we are figuring it out, we're surviving. Um, and that's what I'm gonna keep doing. A few weeks ago on this program, we talked about people-to-people -people responses to the crisis in Puerto Rico. This week, I spoke with Rosa Clemente, hours after she got back from Puerto Rico. She went with her own delegation, PR on the map, and gave us what amounts to a reality check on our aspirations. You can find an excerpt of my interview with Rosa on our blog, where you can also sign up to receive more directly into your inbox. Check out Rosa Clemente's reporting from Puerto Rico at PROnTheMap.com. Thanks. 